Act 4, a uh, little bit of background information as to what was happened historically between the time that Act 3 ended uh, with Senna's death and, and all the funeral stuff and the rites, and then where we pick up, it's important that we read the building background, uh, which says that after Brutus and Cassius and the other conspirators fled Rome, Antony took charge of the city. He was soon joined by 18-year-old Caius Octavius, Caesar's great nephew and adopted son. Because remember, Caesar didn't have sons and heirs, and so this individual was an adopted child, but his, you can see that the real relation was the great nephew. Octavius was intelligent, handsome, and skilled at oratory, which means speaking, public speaking, and as we know, Antony was as well. Easily a potential fellow leader with the 40-year-old Antony. Together with a governor named Lepidus, Octavius and Antony created a ruling triumvirate. To prevent internal opposition, the triumvirate began their reign by murdering 200 of Rome's political leaders. Among these was the elderly senator and philosopher Cicero, a passionate defender of the Roman Republic. Cassius and Brutus, meanwhile, assembled their armies in the, an area that is now northern Greece which is just east of uh, Italy. So if you can think of that on a map. Uh, there they awaited the battle for the future of Rome. So look at what uh, Antony did. Antony and this ruling party of three, so three people will make the decisions, not just one person. So they can talk it out. Maybe they can have votes within their little group of three. But Antony seems to be the main decision maker, especially if he's 40 and Octavius is only 18. Okay, there's some some year difference there. Um, but uh, a lot of people to, to, could have stood up and opposed him. And so they, how I many did say 200 people? They went and killed and murdered these individuals. That doesn't sound like a very positive thing. But in order to keep control and keep Rome the way it needs to be during this rough transition phase, this had to happen. And so all of these people even associated or thought to be associated with the assassination of Caesar was uh, you know, ultimately uh, crushed, caught, and killed um, as, you know, as they could find them. Um, so Act 4, Scene 1. Notice the location. It's Antony's house in Rome. Look at the timing of this. Look how much time has passed. A year and a half. If you didn't notice that, you'd think it was the next day. But you need to understand that the time, how much time has passed, so that all of that uh, action could have happened, even though it didn't happen on stage. But the story is still going and still going, and we've jumped now, uh, teleported rather, a year and a half down the road. Um, so we are in Antony's house. We have the three triumvirate, well, eventually three, but um, Antony and Octavius uh, really talking about um, what's our next step? What do we do here? Uh, we have uh, Caesar's will. What are we going to do with that? What do we need to do with our armies? Pay particular attention to what Antony feels or how Antony feels about Lepidus, who is the third member of the Triumvirate. Does he look at him as an equal or does he look at him as an inferior way down below? Like that guy shouldn't even be a part of it. So see what that is. I think it's pretty obvious, but those are elements that you should be able to pick up on uh, on your own. Uh, so scene one, act four. Act four, scene one. Antony's house in Rome a year and a half after Caesar's death. Enter Antony, Octavius, and Lepidus. These many shall then die. Their names are pricked. Your brother too must die. Consent you, Lepidus. I do consent. Prick him down, Antony. Upon condition Publius shall not live, who is your sister's son, Mark Antony. He shall not live. Look, with a spot I damn him. But, Lepidus, go you to Caesar's house. Fetch the will hither, and we shall determine how to cut off some charge in legacies. What? Shall I find you here? Or here, or at the capital? Exit, Lepidus. This is a slight, unmeritable man, meet to be sent on errands. Is it fit, the threefold world divided, he should stand one of the three to share it? So you thought him and took his voice, who should be pricked to die, in our black sentence and prescription. Octavius, I have seen more days than you. And though we lay these honors on this man to ease ourselves of divers' slanderous loads, he shall but bear them as the ass bears gold, to groan and sweat under the business, either led or driven, as we point the way. 
and having brought our treasure where we will, then take we down his load and turn him off like to the empty ass to shake his ears and graze in commons. You may do your will, but he's a tried and valiant soldier. So is my horse, Octavius, and for that I do appoint him store of provender. It is a creature that I teach to fight, to wind, to stop, to run directly on, his corporal motion governed by my spirit, and in some taste is Lepidus but so. He must be taught and trained and bid go forth, a barren-spirited fellow, one that feeds on objects, arts, and imitations, which, out of use and stalled by other men, begin his fashion. Do not talk of him but as a property. And now, Octavius, listen great things. Brutus and Cassius are levying powers. We must straight make head. Therefore let our alliance be combined, our best friends made, our means stretched. And let us presently go sit in council, how covert matters may be best disclosed, and open perils surest answered. Let us do so, for we are at the stake, and bade about with many enemies, and some that smile have in their hearts, I fear, millions of mischiefs. They exit. They exit. Act 4, Scene 1, Anthony's house. We see the triumvirate's uh, inner workings. We see what Mark Antony thinks of Lepidus, um, that the, the conquered world, how is it fair that it's divided amongst these three people? He doesn't feel that Lepidus is an equal. He compares him to what? A donkey and a horse, okay? He says that he's an errand boy, okay? He's an errand boy. Oh, he's a good fighter. He does the, what he's supposed to. So does my horse. And is it fair that we give a third of the known conquered world to a horse? I don't think so. And so we can, and it's important for us to see that it isn't like this, you know, the three amigos, everybody's happy and this is going on and, and it's a happy rule. I mean, there's still friction and they're, they're still struggling. Um, look at the very beginning, what they're doing on those first couple lines. These many then shall die, their names are pricked. So imagine them making a list as they write them down, they're, they're, they're hosed. Your brother too must die. Consent you, Lepidus? I do consent. Can you imagine? They're, they're playing God in essence. They're signing death certificates and death warrants. Could you do that for a... Well, maybe... I don't think you would actually do it for your brother's sister. I don't like my brother, so yeah, I'd do it. Well, but realistically, I mean, could you imagine having that power? And we're not talking the moral and ethical dilemmas that it has, but I mean, that's just, that, that's scary. Octavius goes, then prick him down, Antony. Well, upon condition, Plubilius shall not live. Who is your sister? Well, if I have to kill my brother, well, then you have to, you know, your nephew, your sister's son, Mark Antony. Oh, he shall not live. Look, with a spot, I damn him. So imagine a name, and he signs off on it, puts a little, um, you know, pen blotch on the, on the parchment. Oh, Lepidus, go to Caesar's house, fetch the will hither, and we shall determine how to cut off some charge in legacies. Look at the footnote. Look at what his goal is. They want to reduce some of the money that Caesar left in his will for the people. They need it for their treasury, they need it to start putting their army together. They need some of that money. They don't want to give all of what Caesar had to the public, like Caesar's will said. But didn't Mark Antony say that this that Caesar left all this? Oh well, yeah, he did. But think about what his motivation was during that speech. Saying anything and everything to get them riled up and support him. Now it's a year and a half later. Go get the will. We're going to see if we can't. It's almost like the lawyers. Have you ever heard, um, you know, talk about, oh, it's in the fine print. It's in the details. You always have to read every little thing, and they can put some clause in the bottom that's really going to get you. Like your cell phone plans. Did you know that if you canceled your cell phone plans, there's a huge penalty? Yeah? $200, $300 in some situations. So if you sign on for two years, oh good, look at the great rate I got, or oh well the rate's gonna go up, or whatever. Well, I wanna change providers. Well, you can change providers, but it's gonna cost you $300 for us to end it. That's the fine print. So he's looking for fine print so we can siphon off some of this money for our cause. So whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, it just shows you how uh, 
uh, how Anthony is willing to have all these people killed and executed. That's, you know, we talked at the intro of this scene about 200 people. Um, these are more of those individuals. And yet how he's looking, since he is kind of the one who had been running Rome, uh, you know, making the tough decisions and choices in order to keep it going. Um, after Lepidus leaves, line 12, this is a slight, unmeritable man, meet to be sent on errands. Is it the threefold world divided? He should stand one of the three to share. So is it fair that this man who I just sent on errands, this guy isn't just some servant. This is one of the three triumvirate, and I just sent him over to get it. He's meant to be a mar uh, an errand boy, not so much a ruler. Is that fair? Oh, well, you know, so you thought him and took his voice. So you asked his opinion about certain stuff, so you must think of him equal. Octavius, I've seen more days than you. And as we read earlier, you know, Anthony's 40-ish, Octavius is 18, so it's almost like a, a parent with their 18-year-old. And the 18-year-old has equal say to what the parent does. But wouldn't the parent more, more times than not kind of talk down to you a little bit? Do your parents talk down to you a little bit at times? Probably deservedly so on some occasions. But in this particular instance, uh, Lepidus is more of a peer of age with Antony, but Antony just doesn't see the character in him. Um, Octavius, he is a tried and valiant soldier. So is my horse, Octavius. And for that, I do appoint him store of provender. So I do give him food, I do take care of him. But my horse is just as, you know, contributes just as much as this guy does. So it's just this kind of a back and forth, back and forth. Um, the last page of this scene, line 42, 43, we really find out what Brutus and Cassius have been doing. And that's when Antony says on line 42-ish, um, he says, Brutus and Cassius are levying powers. We must straight make head, therefore let our alliance be combined, our best friends made. So they're levying forces, they're building up their armies out in Greece, so just east of us. And we need to make sure we put my army with your army. And we need to, even though we rule together, we need to put together and make a great big alliance and go and eventually fight. And so that's what ultimately gets uh, wrapped up in, in this particular scene.